if I was to say, okay, I only need infantry for this mission, and that's the only thing I need, that's not going to go so well. I mean, uh, given the most badass grunt, you're still, you need the support structure, you, you need the, the supply trains, you need to call in artillery, you need, you know, cab support. I mean, so it's like the rest of life, it's actually, life is a, a group activity. And so if you take that approach in a, in a microcosm with medication and uh, eating right and sleeping right and having good friends, staying away from drugs and alcohol and, you know, having some kind of spiritual life or some kind of spiritual belief that gives you a, a, a pillar of strength, that's going to be an approach. That's going to be something that's going to reduce that suffering. When a civilian enters any branch of the military, they go through a period of basic military training that's designed to change the way they think and act to turn them into a soldier, sailor, marine, airman, or coast guardsman. Hard work, hard work. Hard work, hard work. This is seen as an important time in the individual's life, critical for the proper transition from being someone not in the military to part of one of the greatest fighting forces on the planet. After a period of time in the military, however, there's little done in any branch of the service to help that service member transition their mindset to life as a veteran. As we often say here in the Change Your POV podcast network, after one leaves the military, they're never going to be a civilian again. And they're no longer a service member. They're this entirely different third thing, a veteran, with all the experiences, knowledge, strengths, and challenges that go along with that word. One of the most overlooked aspects of transition is a service member's mental health and wellness. If the veteran has their heart, mind, body, and spirit in the right place, and has a support network of family and friends to rely upon, then they're most likely going to have a successful transition. Those things are not in place. Things can get challenging. I'm your host, Dwayne France, and I'm going to take you through a veteran mental health boot camp to give you some advanced training for your brain. These episodes will cover the many different aspects of veteran mental health that I, as both a combat veteran and a clinical mental health counselor, see, experience, and support veterans with daily. I'm going to be joined by both veterans and mental health professionals talking about what you need to know about the stigma against seeking support, the different areas we need to understand, and provide some resources for when you think you might need them. Get up in the morning and out of the rack, because this is some information that could very well save your life. Welcome to Veteran Mental Health Boot Camp. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Headspace and Timing Podcast. Really appreciate, as always, and once again, you're taking the time to listen. Uh, as you know, we're coming up on the end of this series uh, of looking at veteran mental health and going beyond just PTSD and TBI uh, and that uh, the, the mental health concerns or the things that veterans um, and even service member deal with uh, during and after the military are not just PTSD and TBI. And uh, so we just finished up yesterday talking about family systems, you know, be working through that conceptualization that I introduced back in episode 25 and, uh, and I wanted to tack on an, an extra episode here at the end that's not in that conceptualization. Uh, and that has to do specifically with the question that a lot of readers and listeners uh, to the blog and podcast have asked. And that's the, the intersection between medications and veteran mental health. This is a huge stigma, uh, a huge assumption uh, for many veterans uh, seeking mental health that when I go in and talk to a mental health professional, all they're going to do is throw meds at me. And, uh, and so I thought I'd bring on somebody who uh, would be able to talk about that, talk about the benefits of some of it, talk about how it can uh, uh, maybe be reduced, and, uh, and, and just uh, generally have a good conversation 
around this very specific aspect of veteran mental health. So my guest today, uh, again, is somebody that, uh, that when I thought of who I'm going to have on to talk about medications and mental health, he was the first and last person uh, that I thought of, uh, not least of which because he is my boss. So uh, full disclosure, um, he, he does, uh, uh, he is the, the guy that I work for, but uh, more than that, and he is much more than that, and we'll get into that, is Dr. Charles Weber. So uh, Dr. Weber is a uh, retired Army officer, and uh, he's joining us today. Uh, to kind of talk a little bit about medications and, and veteran mental health. So, uh, Chuck, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, uh, Dwayne, and I look forward to kind of answering some of the questions and hopefully getting the word out to show that the medication is one piece of the puzzle to try to reduce that suffering and get our patients and vets into a better place. No, definitely. One piece of the puzzle is uh, is clearly it. I mean, this is the whole... Uh, sort of uh, bent of this series is everybody thinks that the pieces are the entire puzzle uh, and that their solution is the only solution or the solution that they believe. And so even starting off, that's great. Before we get into that, uh, I'd like you to, to tell the audience a little bit about your military experience and and uh, and all the awesome stuff there. Okay, well, I'm not sure it's really awesome, but I definitely feel uh, blessed and uh, great that I had uh, excellent mentors, NCOs. I, I started off 11 Bravo, just an enlisted infantryman, and I only signed up for two years, actually. So I was one of those things just to try to get some college. Lo and behold, as uh, we we know in the military, we know just in life in general, you want to make God laugh, you just make plans. And so now, 28 years later, you know, I, I retire, um, but I did have to go through a little bit of a gauntlet, which was you know, getting into uh, West Point, which uh, I, I was lucky enough to graduate. I was one of five infantrymen in my class, uh, you know, prior enlisted. Uh, so it's a very, uh, a very unique kind of position there where you get screwed with a little bit more, but also a little bit less because you got this stuff on your chest. And so it's, uh, it's, it's just an interesting dynamic. And then I went Medical Service Corps from West Point. Um, I was really wanting to go to medical school, but I knew I really wasn't and I had to work really hard at West Point to kind of get through it and do well and uh, needed that break and so I went to the 101st uh, 3rd Brigade Rockassons had a great time doing the, the kind of platoon leadership health service support officer for uh, the FSB there and uh, from there I got mentored once again by the division surgeon of 101st and got over to the hospital I did a little stint before get accepted to medical school in 1998. So I enlisted in 88. So 98, and I started going to medical school. And I then took uh, a different approach. I, I still say I was like in the reserves. I, I got the scholarship for that too. So I appreciate everybody paying their taxes, getting me through school. And from there, we uh, didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to be an MTO unit. So I actually went flight surgery after my internship at Walter Reed and uh, deployed there. It was a non-combat one, but uh, had plenty of mass cows and plenty of uh, real life experiences, which was just incredible. But I, I really, really had that connection and just seemed to love the, the psych patients the most. They were the most challenging, I'm not saying challenging patients, but there's just challenging dynamics. And it's really how it's kind of honed my approach uh, by taking a, a biological, a psychological, a social, and a spiritual kind of approach, a four legs of a chair, uh, as I know you and I have talked before, knowing that meds are one piece of that, but to, to have all those kind of dynamics intersect, which can either gravitate and kind of strengthen us, or at sometimes, uh, you know, take us up at the knee and uh, and kind of make us stumble a little bit. But by taking an approach of a multimodal kind of approach, and I do this with meds and I do this with therapy and we do this with just how you and I have built a family care center in the Colorado Veterans Health and Wellness Agency is to be that piece of the puzzle. So from there, I went into a psychiatry residency and uh, then was the chief resident there. So I, once again, it seems like in the Definitely in the in the military, if you want uh, something done, you give it to a busy man. And I just kept on taking more and more. And uh, luckily, also got to be the uh, division psychiatrist for First Cav, 
incredible experience in, in Baghdad and uh, met some just wonderful people and, and really got exposed to a, a lot of different things that uh, just like anybody, you know, war changes you, but you can, you can kind of shape it a little bit. But some of us have a little bit more difficulty with that, that coach, that therapist, that social support set network, or having strengths in all four of those areas that I just mentioned. So my journey uh, kind of ended uh, whenever my wife, uh, who is a family practice doc and also a vet, decided that the Fort Carson was going to be my last duty station. In this last duty station, I was the chief of behavioral health. I had been previously the chief of behavioral health at Fort Benning. And in this position, got a, a lot of exposure to the community, uh, much higher level kind of policies and implementation of a lot of DOD programs. Uh, the most famous one or the most uh, successful one, I think, is the Embedded Behavioral Health. We have the uh, little microcosm of, of uh, behavioral health, talk therapy, nurse case management, med management, uh, admin, staff, uh, all uh, co-located in the brigade's footprint. And, you know, we've known about this for years, but actually getting the funding, getting the policy all behind it, it's been just a huge success. From when I enlisted in 88, I, I think that the stigma has just dramatically decreased. Yes, it's still there, but I think the majority of that is the personal stigma that we kind of bring to the table from our own backgrounds and maybe individually or our own units or, you know, that you kind of feed off or mirror off your battle buddies. But as far as an organizational kind of stigma, it, it has just been taken down by leaps and bounds. And so I think that we've made a, a great progress uh, in the military and after leaving the uh, active duty, I, uh, I, I, got, uh, I got the opportunity to take over this family care center and kind of grow it and build it. And then got to meet you, Duane, and uh, my office manager also had to get another retired NCO. Officers can't do anything without NCOs. So I need to make sure that uh, this, this goes on. And we created the, the nonprofit, the uh, Colorado Health and uh, Veterans Health and Wellness Agency, and trying to get that back to the community, back to the vets, and making sure that they have mental health uh, access and, and care to augment and suppl supplement the, the VA, or when the VA sometimes has those stumbling blocks too, we are, are that bridge for those veterans. So giving back to the community, giving back to, to my people, and my people are all the vets and their family members, and uh, really loving all the challenges and the new approaches. 28, 28 years summed up in about five minutes. Um, but uh, is it 28 or 26? Uh, well, 28, but the four is the reserves during the, the, the med school. So, you know, really 24, I guess, after duty. And then, but, you know, actually the last two years of med school, I, I did, my, my wife and I, since we were both classmates together, we, we followed the issues. So actually, I think I had maybe four rotations that were civilian. So funny enough, even though I wasn't really getting paid, I, I wore my uniform and I, I did all um, medical centers uh, and uh, MTO units while I was in med school. And, you know, I, it, my passion has always been to try to get back to the, the, the ground pounders and get back to the, the real units. Of course, as you get rank, you got to take some of those desk jobs uh, every so often. But like you're in residency, I... We were with the 25th because I was at, after Walter Reed and my flight surgery stint, we went to uh, a troop learning. That's where I did my residency in psychiatry. And I was missing the soldiers. So I, I got a, a waiver to do my third year uh, almost exclusively in the 25th. And uh, great exposure, trying to do more stuff with the MTO units and uh, the ground pounders. And, uh, and I ended up seeing more patients than all my other uh, year class group uh, combined. So it's just a great experience. And once again, if you keep doing good things, it seems like the military loves to just shove it down your throat and you smile while you do it. Well, and I, and I think it's uh, really interesting, uh, just your background. You did not go directly into uh, psychiatry. Um, you, you had sort of that stair step, but it started out on, uh, was it Sand Hill on, uh, at Benny? Um, yep. and, uh, and, and sort of, you know, going through that, that's not a typical route for the medical service corps in the military. Uh, and so you had a different, unique 
um, experience that that sort of said you know you always wanted to get back to the ground pounders and and it was it sounds like what 10 12 years before you really emerged into psychiatry um, you, you know from when you first enlisted and and so in and I guess I'd like to hear a little bit more about what drew you to veteran mental health specifically when you had a wide range again flight surgery you could have been a flight surgeon you could have stayed um, you know uh, in, in the the whatever mainstream um, uh, surgical field, why veteran mental health in particular? You know, that's, you know, we, we, we kind of always try to do a little bit of self, uh, you know, introspection, but also, you know, not to get cheesy with the whole comic book thing, but you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And I, I just seem to have a knack with making the rapport and perhaps it was my background. I already had, you know, EIB, or more air assault, EFMB, you know, the, the stuff from the chest that kind of got me in the door. Now, usually as soon as I open my mouth, I screw that up. But besides that, you know, walking into a staff, walking into a, a unit or having a patient come see you, I, I, I had that instant buy-in. And so it, maybe that made it a little bit easier or maybe I just, I didn't talk to him like a psychiatrist. I, I don't really hang out with many psychiatrists. In fact, like, I think maybe one. Uh, you know, we're kind of a, a weird group uh, overall, uh, and I, I tended to just be who I am and, uh, you know, trying to use that kind of knowledge base. And when you got that feedback, you know, it's, it's and as you know, I mean, this is how we do therapy, right? It's a, the number one thing with that, that the outcomes for the soldier, the patient, the family member is that therapeutic alliance and that rapport. And as much as I had a passion towards it, I, but I, I got that back. And so to even tell your readers and your listeners, you know, I, to keep looking for that, that uh, therapist, that provider that you have that connection with, because you're, you're going to make leaps and bounds and the energy from both of you all, I think is going to, to have an overall better outcome than if you were just, let's say the most brilliant Harvard, uh, you know, psychiatrist or, LPC trained, you know, you know, regardless if you're a sergeant major, if you're, if I was a, a two-star general, but I don't have that rapport, it doesn't matter. So all that stuff, it's great for the CV and it looks good on paper, but when you get into that room and start doing the work that is needed to get to that next uh, level, that's where I got the feedback, both from, I, I think my own abilities, uh, listening to, you know, uh, as far as God and as far as my, my passion towards that, and just trying to relieve suffering. And so when when I got the feedback from the patients as well, and I, I seemed to see these people getting better, or at least taking the steps towards uh, getting better and just relieving some of their suffering, it it, it kind of propels you, you know? Almost like at the end of a, a long uh, road march, or I mean, you're trying to, you're rocking, but you know, how, how do you get those last two miles in carrying 80 pounds, especially when I was a saw gunner and you got the 600 rounds. I mean, you, there's something that you push towards, towards the end, and it was the closest similarities, the closest mirroring to being with a real unit is to have that, that experience with the vet and experience with the patient that they, they allowed me into their world enough that I, I could reduce some of that suffering. And it was just so rewarding. So that's is that an okay summary. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think it's, it's exactly, um, it's, it's absolutely accurate, of course, uh, but it's it's the lived experience you had um, being applied in a different way that was uh, that was fairly unique. Not all eleven bravos um, become psychiatrists, and and when uh, when you do get that, um, it it leads to it's the clinical training, it's a clinical experience combined with the lived experience that really makes it beneficial. And I like how you said, and it's something that I often say to my clients and and the readers and listeners is uh, you don't stop. Uh, when when you run up against someone that that you don't get along with, um, you know if if uh, you don't like the first mechanic that you come across, you have to keep looking for a mechanic because the engine still needs to be fixed. But somehow with with service members, they have one experience with a mental health professional that they don't like, uh, and then they just stop um, and and suffer. Um, and and so, like you said, just keep looking for keep uh, uh, keep seeking out that person that you have a connection with. Uh, one of my earliest episodes with uh, my co-host, Jeff Adamek, it took him uh, three different clinicians before he finally found somebody that could help him 
uh, with his PTSD. And he, uh, and he went through the whole process of the first one was arrogant, the second one was clueless, and then the third one finally, you know, was the one. But he didn't stop looking. So it was really great that you, you brought that out. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's it's, uh, it's something we have to do. I mean, and part of that, you know, we call it rupture repair, but I think we're uniquely positioned as vets is, I mean, I mean, everybody raise their hand in a sense whenever you've had a, a bad first sergeant or bad commander. Just you, you always hope that you don't have two bad ones. You know, one can usually offset the other one. If you have two, that's a terrible unit, and, and you got to make some changes. But we also have persevered through it. We've still gotten the mission done. And I think people lose focus on that, that they've already been successful. They've already successfully jumped over the obstacles. Now, as we're looking at ourselves and we're looking at, you know, the things that we're struggling with, we, we tend to find some excuses. And it would be an easy excuse for me, like, ah, my, my, my therapist, my doc, you know, they're an idiot. And, uh, or, you know, they, they don't care. And so we kind of can externalize it. And it gives us one more data point versus, you know what, I've done this before. I'm going to eke out everything I can from this person, even if I think they're a dipshit. That's exactly right. And in, in your experience, or, or maybe in your um, area of the mental health field, um, you hear that a lot with veterans. Again, and I, I alluded to it at the beginning of the show, was that uh, when I go to the VA, um, you know, all they're going to do is throw meds at me. Uh, I tell a story, I was, uh, this was probably three years ago now, uh, that I had gone out to the community for, uh, you know, a medical procedure, just a, a checkup. And it was a specialist, and she said, uh, you know, was going through the whole intake. She said, so what kind of medication is he on? I said, uh, I take an allergy pill and a uh, nasal, you know, whatever. Uh, and she kind of stood there with the, with the pen, you know, getting ready to write and, like, looking at me. And I said, no, that's it. And she was like, but you were sent here by the VA, right? And I said, yes. And she was like, usually when I see veterans – they come with 17 different medications and they hand me a sheet and she's like, how do you, you know, whatever. Um, and, and it was in, in, in that sort of even people who outside the VA, that's what they expect is veterans who are experiencing mental health conditions are going to be medicated significantly. Would you like to talk about that for a bit? Uh, and you know, uh, you know, I think that it, it goes back to also the approach of maybe my unique experience or, you know, just, the, the way that uh, that I, I was trained, but it, it is one piece of the puzzle. And when we when we think that the the reasons why we're having a condition or PTSD symptoms, or the reason why we're even walking into that doc's or that provider's office, is because of one thing, I think that's a, a little short sighted. And so if it's think about a mission. I mean, if I was to say, okay, I only need infantry for this mission, and, and that's the only thing I need. Mm, that's not going to go so well. I mean, uh, given the most badass grunt, you're still you need the support structure, you you need the the supply trains, you need to call in artillery, you, you need you know cab support. I mean, so it's like the rest of life. It's actually life is a a group activity, and so if you take that approach in a, in a microcosm with medication and uh, eating right and sleeping right and having good friends, staying away from drugs and alcohol. And, you know, having some kind of spiritual life or some kind of spiritual belief that gives you a, a, a pillar of strength, that's going to be an approach. That's going to be something that's going to reduce that suffering. And so I look at the diagnosis is one thing and, and very classically trained or maybe the old things is here. You have a diagnosis. Therefore, I must do A, B and C. I, I like to use evidence based and I think that's a, a good approach, but it's only one piece of the puzzle. If you actually get to know the patient, you get to know and hear their areas of their strengths and their weaknesses or their, their challenges and their suffering. And then I start kind of trying to peel things back. And so I, I try to do more of a symptomatic approach initially, take some of the symptoms away so then they can engage in the real treatment modality, which I still believe is, is therapy, is, is doing the CBT, the cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive processing therapy, the EMDR, the, the prolonged exposure, all, all of the kind of evidence-based, nobody's really going to interact with that if they're not sleeping. If you're sleeping two hours a night and you have nightmares and you're afraid to leave the house, it's going to be hard to do therapy. Okay, let's, I break that down and I give symptomatic relief 
try to add a baseline that might be evidence-based, but if not, I'll take what I can get. It's, it's, it's always also a partnership. So I'm not the approach of the black or white. Well, if you don't take this pill, you, I can't see you. Or, you know what, you're on too many benzos. Well, okay, maybe they are. Let's take some off or let's see what is going on with, with the, the person in front of me and then treat them individually. And also still going down, like, listen, you're not going to get a complete remission with just my meds. I, I need you to engage in these other areas. And uh, another piece that we've kind of brought in our, our clinic, right, is even the transcranial magnetic stimulator. I waited for years. It's been uh, FDA approved since 2008, but I waited for years until I saw some of the evidence. Now, right now, it's only clinically indicated for major depressive disorder, but there is some UK and Canada using for trauma and PTSD, and actually a little bit more of the anxious and OCD kind of spectrum. So I'm really hopeful that that will be a piece of the puzzle that can take the symptoms away from the guy or girl in front of me and get them into the talk therapy to have a complete remission and a, a, a reduction of their symptoms. I want their life to improve. I don't want them to keep coming back to me for refills every three to six months. And so that's at least my approach. And I, and I, and I hope it's made a difference in the patients. And I think I've made a difference uh, in a, in a, a policy and also in our organization because that's this is something I talk about quite frequently with everybody, and we've we've got a great organization doing that, like you. So and and I think that and that's what I often explain to my clients or veterans that I talk with is that medications do have a place uh, in uh, in recovery, uh, but they're not the the only thing. Um, I I explain it as um, it's something to sort of calm the waters. Uh, so that you can learn how to navigate on the water, so how to build some skills. As you said, you know, if their anxiety is through the roof, they're not going to be able to even come into a session or, or sit through a, a DBT skills group or, um, you know, engage in things. Uh, and so the medications can be used initially to, as you said, uh, relieve symptoms, um, and then working in tandem um, to get to some of the underlying issues. That seems to be the piece that many veterans are missing. They go to the VA or they go to, um, you know, even on active duty and they just say, here's your meds. Uh, and then that's it. There is no um, secondary support either through groups or, or through individual therapy to sort of take them off of that. Yeah, and I, I think that even as chief, I mean, we, we always had things coming down that was basically saying, okay, we need to increase our productivity, see more patients. And I, I, I think I got that mission done. I so that was my mission, but I really tried to balance as much. And, and it's great in private practice. I mean, I, I see 30 minute follow ups and hour intakes. And I, that, that's actually even different than most of the uh, psychiatric community. I mean, there's not many of us here in Colorado Springs, but the way to truly make money in there is to see a patient every 10 to 15 minutes. Now, that that is to me. Yes, that'll be great financially, but it's not good for the patient. And it is nice to, to take this approach and to build my own practice to say, this is the approach. And this is actually, I mean, we have three nurse practitioners, right? Uh, we're about to get a fourth. And I want them to follow that same model too. Take the 30-minute uh, follow-ups, do the uh, hour intakes, and to have better quality. So then we can focus on more than just throwing some meds at people. Now, sometimes uh, medications are, are absolutely necessary. There are some conditions that simply no amount of therapy is going to uh, address, uh, you know, so like schizoaffective disorder or schizophrenia, uh, bipolar disorder, right? I mean, there's, there's some things that you just, you, the medications like high cholesterol or diabetes, there's some psychological conditions that medications are absolutely necessary for. True, true. And, you know, but they've also had some studies that basically said, hey, that this person can improve, let's just say with schizophrenia, if they, you know, some of it's just kind of psychoeducation or supportive therapy, but it is still a type of therapy. I mean, I mean and we call them act teams, right? And we call them uh, life skills, but really this is still like, you know, therapy light. Um, or if you can think about going to physical therapy, this is mental, physical, mental therapy uh, to try to reduce that. I mean, how many people have gone to physical therapy and had a complete remission of everything? It's, it's, but I can definitely, you know, if we can reduce pain from eight to two, that's a win or at least more than even the scale functionality. 
So if they can get out of the house, if they can engage in life again, uh, and, and there's a way to do it that's legal and that's, uh, that is uh, a good use of time for both uh, the provider and uh, the patient, the vet, I say we do it. And uh, I'm, I'm open to that. I mean, I do want to focus on evidence base. Don't want them to waste their time. But what, what's the statement? I started using your statement that you brought. I mean, once the, you know, once the puppy is dead or once the fishing trip is over, now it's time to actually do the work, right? Yeah, I mean, and, and again, those uh, those sort of alternative therapies um, are, are maybe beneficial in their own way, but as part of, of the overall uh, response. Um, I, I recently had uh, on the show uh, Jane Strong from the Equus Effect, um, and she was talking about the benefits of, of working with horses, um, but only as a shortcut to get them get a veteran aware of their own emotions and then back into therapy where they can do the actual work. Um, and it's the difference, I think, between um, someone believing that their solution is the only solution, um, that uh, the only thing the veteran needs is a, you know, trip to the mountains or, or the only thing they need is a five-day equine therapy thing. Um, and then it's fixed and it's much more complicated than that. And that's the approach that you take when it comes to medications as well. I, I totally agree, and it's not just one of those people that are, are using these different modalities, and 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 you know because we all learn in a different way too. Not everything can be task condition standard, you know. Right. And and so another aspect of of what you work with, and and maybe what you saw in um, in the DoD, um, and then what you have dealt with uh, in other ways is uh, is the opioid crisis and and the use of opiates and painkillers uh, in active duty. Um, I served, uh, I, I was here on Fort Carson 06 and I mentioned it before, I think I mentioned it when I talked to Dr. Kidd and substance abuse uh, back in episode 30, was we had veterans or we had active duty service members dying in the barracks from black tar heroin, um, you know, overdoses and things like that. Uh, and then, you know, the opioid crisis in America, um, widespread, is just horrendous. And it's hitting veterans uh, hard as well when it comes to substance abuse and addictions. The, the opioid uh, crisis, I mean, part, part of it was kind of made, uh, or not made, it was exacerbated by the medical community. Specifically, there was a pain with the fifth vital sign. Uh, if you if you didn't ever heard that before, and people were going for years. Uh, I think it was in the late 90s. They they said this uh, based on it was actually one small study that said, oh, if you're in pain, you're not going to get addicted to opioids. Well, we know a little bit more with the biochemistry now that that yes, you can. You know, even when you're in pain and you still can upregulate or cause what we call hyperogesia, which is a a rebound pain because you actually created more opioid receptors. And this is actually where the withdrawal piece comes. People might start for pain or euphoria, but then they actually continue usually just to prevent the withdrawal, which is uh, horrendous, um, you know, seen through my patients in social detox and things like that. So the opioid crisis, you know, this is where my wife, she's family practice and uh, for years just moved with me, GS, you know, uh, working in the family clinics and stuff after she got off active duty. Um, and... And, and the thing is, but she was part-time, uh, full-time mom, part-time doc, right? And still treating the vets, treating the family members, uh, loving the active duty. But the uh, the thing about being part-time is you're not there all the time, and then you're giving probably the patients that nobody else wants. And so she became, you know, by default, the the opioid expert. And she had to try to find a way. These people were on morphine and Percocets for years, and how do you manage? How do you manage the pain? How do you manage their opioids? This is before it became really big, and so this is where she and I are both suboxone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. So suboxone is a, a treatment. It is in that harm reduction model, and methadone is in that harm reduction model. But methadone can still be abused, still have an overdose on it. And Suboxone doesn't have those uh, problems. Suboxone has what we call a ceiling effect, and it's a partial agonist. So it, it's really hard to overdose on unless you mix with benzodiazepines or alcohol or a few other meds. Uh, and the other part of it is it's not a, by being a partial agonist, it's not fully activating that, that receptor. It just isn't 
imperfect key. It, it calms down so you're not going to have the withdrawals. The naltrexone stops the uh, euphoria uh, of it. And so these people get on with their life. And then slowly we try to wean them off. Now, some people, there, there's a lot of stuff out there. I tell uh, your listeners not to go to Wikipedia, uh, go to medical kind of sites. But, uh, you know, Suboxone has, I, I've seen it dramatically change people's lives. They get their marriages back. They get, they start to work again. And, uh, you know, I can get about 30% of the people off completely. And, and m- most of the time we get down to such a low dose that because of their experiences when they were in withdrawals or with that, what they've done when they've done relapses, the patient just will not get on. I mean, they're on a, like maybe a two over 0.5 milligrams. I mean, the, the teeniest dose, I mean, for Suboxone film, that's like licking it, you know, it's not really doing a lot physiologically, but the psychological strength that they know that they have that taken care of allows them to go on with their life. And so you just meet them where they're at. Um, and uh, so, you know, she still is doing that uh, for the community. And uh, I did it as well as the clinical consultant for ASAP and the chief of uh, behavioral health is I was still a Suboxone provider. So, And, and that's, uh, a, I think, a great example of uh, a condition that, that cannot be uh, resolved or relieved without the support of med- medication. Um, you know, okay, you can stop smoking cold turkey. You know, maybe if, if uh, alcohol dependence isn't a, a, uh, an issue, you could stop drinking cold turkey. Uh, but when it comes to significant, um, you know, when it comes to heroin uh, addiction or, or opiate addiction, uh, it's not something, it, it's even counterindicated that you don't do cold turkey, uh, quit cold turkey. And, and so there's medications that can support that, but it doesn't have to be, you know, the number one, as you said, and you've said uh, repeatedly, it's not the only solution, you, you know, that uh, client, I imagine, um, you know, new playgrounds and new playmates, you can't, you know, live within the same, you know, hang out in this, with the same people who are active using and, and that's just going to make recovery harder. Um, and medication is a part of it. And so when, when veterans come in and say, well, I don't want to, you know, I, I want to do this, you know, with my mental health concerns, maybe my depression, um, uh, substance abuse, PTSD, that I want to do this without medication. There's times when medication can really help uh, in, in kind of calm it down and then to learn the skills to move forward. Yeah, I mean, and uh, the evidence, just like what you said, I mean, it's especially uh, don't get around the same people that uh, that you used to use with. I mean, there is a, the reward pathways change completely. So that social, biopsychosocial, spiritual, so that social aspect, that environment that you keep going back to, if it's, uh, if it's putting you at risk, not going to be beneficial. I mean, some of the best evidence is, um, you know, doing the medication-assisted therapy, but that is a piece of the puzzle with, uh, doing the motivational interviewing and with doing the, uh, the you know, the substance dependent kind of treatment and, and having the AA and the NA kind of uh, approach, that 12 step approach. It's, it creates a social norm, has a little bit of the spiritual, some are more secular. Uh, I tell people to keep looking, but these are pieces of the puzzle. And you're right, they can't, they won't even go to the table. They won't even try to eat right or start to do some any kind of exercises if they're withdrawal symptoms are over, um, you know, just overacting and overwhelming. So, and this is, I I guess, what what would you say to veterans who say, well, I'm not going to go to a shrink because all they want to do is throw meds at me. You've heard it all the time. I hear it all the time, you know, that I'm not going to go to the VA because all they're going to do is throw meds at me. Uh, And then they just sit there and suffer. Um, So, what would you say to encourage veterans um, that are maybe listening to this or providers that work with veterans that are listening to this to be able to kind of help them through that? Well, I hope that they listen to some of the other stuff that we've said, because I think we've given some great tidbits, but uh, advocate, advocate for yourself. I mean, we've also heard it right is who manages a career you do, you know, it is always great to find a mentor and to find somebody to help the, uh, the, the military has got all these great opportunities for those with initiative and kind of that energy. But this, all the sacrifices that we've made, the VA is one of our benefits. And I think there are really good people there. I think the system is a little bit overwhelmed in the way that they've kind of put things together. It's probably the mo- not most conducive or patient-centered all the time. But there are good people. Keep looking. 
ask for somebody else or, or, you know, give that person a shot, try it out. And if it looks like that's going to be their approach, there's no way to meds are the only way, then, or they spend five minutes with you, then find somebody to advocate for yourself. And then there are plenty. I think the Vet Choice uh, program is one of the things that are available out there. You know more about the procedural because uh, you're my veteran director. So you know, procedurally how to get that, but then go to somebody else in the community and give us a shot as well. You know, so if they're in the, if people are listening in the Colorado Springs, Denver area, uh, I'd say give us a shot as well because we're going to take this approach. If it seems like this is resonating with any of your listeners to, okay, you know, I can possibly I'll be on a few meds for a while and then we take a drug holiday or, you know, symptomatic or we call PRN or as needed meds. If that's all you need, we'll, we'll take the approach that works for you. And there are other therapists, there are other providers out there that will take our same approach. I hope, I mean, I know we're not the only ones. And I think that VA too, I just, you, you might have to dig a little deeper and you might have to persevere a little longer and not to give up after having that one bad squalor, that one bad platoon sergeant. Come on, we've, we've sucked it down before. People can make it through this. You know, I, I like how you said that, and this is something that I've often um, uh, told veterans when they go to the VA too, is to be your own advocate. Uh, because many times uh, when they will go in to see a med management provider, med management provider says, okay, I'm going to give you this. And the veteran's like, well, okay, you're the doc. You must know. Right. You know, that they, they, there's sort of that. And I don't know if it's a matter of when we were in the military, people with not even as as clear as people with degrees were officers and over us. But but just sort of that you say do and I do. You're in a position of authority. And so maybe some of that carries over into post-military life. Um, and that's sort of like, well, you're the doc. You're supposed to know where you're saying advocate for yourself you are the expert on you and you can say you know what i want to do the bare minimum of whatever you give me so that i don't have the extreme side effects so you have to give me more and more and more and it's this domino effect uh and and i think that is the biggest thing where veterans are just not advocating for themselves when it comes to medications in mental health yeah, i think that's a, that's a great point and you know that's what you're talking about in the big sense is called basically the taking that paternal or that partnership. So the paternal kind of approach or authoritarian is I'm in charge. I'm the doc. Here's my white coat or stethoscope. You must do. And you know that that'll work for a little bit, but it's almost the like same thing. I mean, how, how many times have we had that authoritarian leader? Yeah, they can pull that out every so often, but not the most effective leaders. Same thing with the provider. The provider is that coach and leader for you, but it should be a partnership and you should have that buy-in. Uh, having a one, one-sided one conversation is not a conversation. And this, your mental health, your overall functionality, and your life is much more important than that. So I, I think that it is a reflection of the severity of either your approach or your uh, your struggles is if, if you give up too soon. And, and don't want them to ring the bell too soon. I, I need them to stay in the fight. Sometimes that 50% is just showing up, right? Just keep coming. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I think that is uh, that is as much, you know, don't be afraid of the medications. The medications can be yet another tool to assist you um, in getting that uh, life of stability and happiness that we've all uh, desired and, and in many ways earned in our military service. Um, and, and then just to say, you know, you can advocate. You can say, you know what, this is what I want, this is what I don't want. Uh, and you're not going to get court-martialed because it's not a possibility anymore. Uh, so you're not going to, what are they going to do? Bend your dog tags and send you home? Um, and you're already home. No, this, is, uh, this has been great. I, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time um, on the, uh, the busiest of, of busiest times. But I think this really adds to the conversation um, of 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 med- veteran mental health overall. This is something that it's the elephant in the room uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with these conditions. So uh, thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time. No, thank you for uh, giving us this venue to uh, to do this, and I hope it reaches if it changes one person. And I think you, you've done great. It'd be great if we expected at thousands, but I'll take one. Take one. 
So uh, to kind of close out here a little bit, of course, uh, um, we're going to have these on the show notes and, and links to everything. But uh, if people who are in Colorado Springs who said that I want to work with that guy because uh, he sounds like the kind of guy that I want to work with, uh, how do they get a hold of you, us, and, uh, and, and find out more? I would tell them to we, we do the first approach would be just our, our, our website or clinic. So that's www.fccsprings.com. That's Family Care Center Springs.com. You can Google it and uh, it'll come up for Family Care Center at, at Colorado Springs. Our number is 719-540-2100 front desk and they can get you to the intake place, whether it be a family member or a retiree or a veteran. Um, and and we'll take care of you. We'll we'll make sure that we can do uh, what we can do for you. Now there are those that also qualify. We have had a couple uh, grants from the strong work from yourself, uh, Dwayne, that we will uh, try to see if if you're eligible and that we can even give you care with no cost. That would be the the thing that we even made the nonprofit for was to try to have that venue for those people that have the bad papers or have the that, that gap in services. And so I would say first, take a look at our website, give us a call, you know, try us out and uh, let us see if we can help you on this road. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I'll make sure that uh, all of those are linked in the show notes and, uh, and this is going to be part of the, the overall series that uh, I think is really going to help uh, veterans uh, who are, you know, seeking more information about this, um, family members, uh, definitely spouses and parents and siblings who may want to know more about what their uh, service member is going through or has gone through. And then, of course, um, our colleagues in the mental health field uh, to really understand uh, more in depth than, than uh, just sort of what they may believe is common knowledge. So um, thank you very much uh, for coming on the show. No, thank you so much, and I hope we reach a couple of providers too. And uh, it'd be great to have them have you talk, or or myself, or doing a lunch and learn, or something. But we can, I think we can change some of the providers too, because they're. They, I hope everybody has that uh, chance for change and to improve their life. So thank you so much, Joy. Yeah, absolutely. So that was a great episode with Dr. Charles Weber talking about medications and their impact on veteran mental health. You can find the show notes on this show and many of the things we talked about at either changerpov.com or veteranmentalhealth.com. Looking for episode HST036. This is the 12th episode of the Veteran Mental Health Boot Camp, a series brought to you by the Change Your POV Podcast Network and the Headspace and Timing Podcast. If you're a veteran or service member, the family member of one, or support veterans in any way, then this series is designed to help you understand more about veteran mental health. If you're just now getting into the series, go back and check out episode HST025, where we introduce the concept of looking beyond PTSD and TBI in regards to veteran mental health. Make sure you subscribe to the Change Your POV podcast network on your podcast player of choice and sign up for updates at changeyourpov.com and veteranmentalhealth.com. We would love to hear your feedback regarding this series and all of the shows in the Change Your POV podcast network. You can do so by visiting our Facebook group, leaving a comment, or review on iTunes. Remember, veteran mental health and wellness is the basis of a successful post-military life and one that all who answered our nation's call to serve deserves. Remember, brothers and sisters, you're not alone, ever. That's what I say.